you what, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit today. I'm feeling um, feeling on on one today. So you guys ready? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm ready Come for this. Now. So um, we're picking up, continuing our series on the Empowered series. Um, you can go ahead and put the slide up here. Um, we've been on this for a week, ne- or not a week, for a, about a month now. Um, we're talking about being radically empowered and becoming radically effective. You know, you've got to be radically empowered. And how do you how do you become radically empowered? Somebody, anybody that's been listening, tell me. Be filled with and walk with the Holy Spirit, right? Because he is the empowerment from on high, right? And it's only when we do that that we'll become radically effective. Okay? You guys believe that? Are you ready to start doing that? Okay. So, leading into... Kaylee's already, Kaylee's on one too. She's, she's going to, she's my cheering section this morning. That's it. <laughs> um, what Mark didn't realize is when the Holy Spirit laid that on him, it led, a, it led, a, it leads right perfectly into the sermon today. The sermon today. <laughs> the question that I have for you, and you'll see exactly why it led into it when I ask you this question, okay? The question I have for you, and Robin tried to seal my thunder by asking the first question, of course. Um, it's okay though. I love you. Um, the question I have for you this morning is have you ever wondered what's the point? Yeah. Mark asked the question, why do you come to church? Yeah. Why do we have church? Why do we do what we do? Have you ever wondered to yourself, what's the point? Yeah. Sure. Have you ever wondered to yourself, like in life, in your life, have you ever wondered to yourself, what's the point? I'll, I'll give you some examples. Have you ever had a conversation with your kid? And Addison, I'm, I love you, baby girl. I'm going to throw you under the bus. <laughs> but I have conversations with her all the time. And if you've ever had a conversation with a preteen or tween or teenage girl, um, you know, girls, they say, have spaghetti noodle brains. Women have spaghetti noodle brains. Um, that's, there's a book about that. It's women have spaghetti noodle brains and waffle, men have waffle brains. Uh, because we compartmentalize things. And women have spaghetti noodle brains because they, they have one noodle that goes all over and it, you got to follow it all over the place. And If you've ever had a conversation with a preteen or teenage girl, you know what I'm talking about. Like, I'll pick up Addison from school and she'll start telling me about stuff that happened at school. And the next thing I know, after like a five, ten minute conversation, I'm lost. And I'm like, okay, so what's the point? You guys ever asked that before? Like, what's the point? Another example is, uh, we spent all day yesterday, and this is this happens pretty much every summertime. Um, we spent all day yesterday trying to get rid of fleas. Anybody have dogs that have flea problems about this time of year? Okay. Ours, ours get covered in them. We have three dogs, and they get covered in them. Our yard is big, and it gets covered in them. Um, and so we spent all day yesterday um, bathing, uh, back of spraying basically like bombing the house and bombing the yard and all of it, not literally bombing, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, but doing all of this stuff, all this stuff to try to get rid of fleets. We even got collars to put on them and they don't like them, but we, we, we put collars on them. Do you know, I, we woke up this morning and I asked, do you even, are, are the fleas still gone? And sure enough, as I asked that Maverick, our biggest dog rolled over and I saw a couple of fleas crawling on him. And I was like, are you kidding me? And it makes me ask, Every single time we get done doing this, it makes me ask, what's the point of all that we did yesterday? Right? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. So up to this point, we've looked at being powered on purpose. That was week one. Okay. We've looked at being plugged in power. That was week two. We took a little pause and Robin preached on being radically reverent the third week. And then last week, we looked at the evidence of empowerment, right? We looked at the actual coming of the Holy Spirit and what it should look like in our lives to be empowered from on high. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. So today, today we're asking the question, you guys say it, what's What's the the point? point? What's the point of this empowerment? What's the point? We're asking that question today, okay? Today, we're actually going to look at I had two ti- I had two titles, so I have the, the 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 cool hip one. What's the point? 
because that one's going to get people's attentions. Mm -hmm. But then there's the, the actual buttoned up Baptist one. The emphasis of empowerment is what we're looking at today. The emphasis of empowerment. Okay. What should we, what should be the emphasis of this empowerment from on high? In other words, what's the point? Okay. You guys ready? Yep. We're going to cover a lot of scripture again, so but we're going to be focused mainly on a couple of verses. So you guys, if you found your uh, place to Acts chapter 2, I didn't even tell you where we're going to be. Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read, yeah, there you go. We're going to read verses 22 through 41. Okay. Um, so you guys go ahead and stand when you find your place. And I like this last week when we did it. Everybody hold your Bibles up or your phones or whatever you're reading God's word on. Everybody, everybody. I'm waiting for everybody. <laughs> it's okay. We'll wait, Ashley. <laughs> okay. Now mark your finger where your place is and hold your Bible up. <laughs> okay. Everybody say, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Okay. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Fellow Israelites. You guys there? Say amen. Amen. Fellow Israelites. Listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. This is Peter just kind of like laying down the gauntlet for him, okay? Just so you guys know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and to kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death. Amen to that. Amen. Because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Can I get any tongues in here to rejoice? Amen. Oh, that was a weak rejoicing right there. <laughs> Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope. Amen for that. Because you will not abandon me in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. You know what he's talking about right there? Jesus. Mm -hmm. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. You guys want gladness? Absolutely. Get in his presence. Amen. There you go. Brothers and sisters. Verse 29. Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. So he just got them quoting David and what David said. And the problem is that these people, they thought this David was talking about himself. Like the people worship David. Mm -hmm. But yet the Messiah was right in front of them for 33 and a half years. And they missed him. Wow. And now he's saying, I can confidently speak to you about David. He is both dead and buried. And his tomb is still with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. Jesus is saying, that stuff that you heard David, that you know about David, that what David said, Jesus was that. God, raised this, God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear right now. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies, make your, enemies your footstool. Therefore, everybody say, Therefore. 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 Let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Then verse 37. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? What, what do we do about this? In other words, what's the point? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the, the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, 
As many as the Lord God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. Mm. I'm telling you guys today, we need to be, have people be saved from this corrupt generation. Amen. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, how many people? 3,000 3, people were added to them. Mm. Lord God, I thank you so much for your word. And I thank you for this sermon. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that it empowers. It empowered Peter back then to preach. And it empowers your preachers today to preach. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to take over this message right now. I, Lord, I decrease and you increase. Let the words that come out of my mouth be nothing but what is glorifying to you and what is honoring to you and what will point people to you. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and I pray that your Logos word that we just read become a Rima word for somebody today that needs a specific word for their life, their, for their soul, for their heart. And we'll be quick to give you all glory, honor, and praise. Right now we ask, Lord, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's children said, amen. 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 You guys can have a seat. <clears throat> So Peter's sermon, which you guys know what, that, that was Peter's sermon, right? That was the majority of Peter's sermon on Pentecost, okay? You guys knew that, right? Mm -hmm. Just to kind of set the stage, last week I read, actually for the last two weeks, I read the, the first part of his sermon, which was a prophecy from Joel saying that the Spirit will be poured out, your sons and daughters will prophesy, and Peter basically said, that's what you're seeing right now, okay? So... His sermon may be the most effective evangelizing sermon of all time. I know you guys are probably thinking, well, what about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? I don't know that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount brought 3,000 people to know Christ. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was probably the best sermon of all time, amen? amen. Actually, I'm going to eliminate the probably and just say it was the best sermon of all time. Amen. Because it's Jesus, amen? Right. But Peter's was probably the best soul-winning sermon of all time. Wow. I don't know, Billy Graham may have had a sermon where he won more than 3,000 people to the Lord at one time. I, I don't really know that for sure. But I know that if it wasn't for Peter's sermon right here, guess what? There would be no Billy Graham winning people to the Lord. Right. Amen? Amen? So I'll, I'll say that. Talk about radically empowered becoming radically effective. Yeah. Amen? That is the epitome of radically empowered on, from on high becoming radically effective for God. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Why can we not do the same thing today? Right. Can we? Yeah. Amen. What's interesting is that this great evangelical sermon, okay? Would you guys agree this was a great evangelical sermon? Yes, absolutely. This great evangelical sermon is sandwiched between two questions. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a reason... There's a reason why I always ask a question first thing up here. You know why? It's to get your brains working and get your brains thinking. And, and it makes you wonder, okay, it makes you really think about the question, right? His sermon was sandwiched between two questions. He didn't ask the questions, but other people asked the questions. In, in verse 12, if you guys go back just a page over or just look up a couple, uh, a couple of lines or whatever, in verse 12, it says, They were all astounded and perplexed. So this is after they were speaking in tongues. This is what, then when they were giving God praises and glory, speaking in other languages, and then they heard in their own language, and they said, it says, they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what in the world does this mean? And then in, the, in verse 37, you saw the other question. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? In other words, these two questions... They can be really summed up into one main question that I'm sure all of you have asked, like we talked about earlier, right? I didn't make you raise your hands, but if, raise your hand if you've ever asked the question, what's the point? Okay? So you've all asked that, and I'm sure that some of you, many of you in here are asking that right now. Because Mark is the one, the Holy Spirit through Mark is the one that led you to start already thinking about that. Why do we come here? Why do we come to church? Why do we do church on Sundays? Why do we do 
praise and worship and then preaching. And why do we do all this stuff? The two questions, they still get asked, or the, this one question of what's the point still gets quest, asked today. And I'm sure many of you are asking it right now. And really, anytime you come to church, we don't have any visitors in here today. Um, I was kind of hoping we would, but we may have some visitors online. I don't even know that we have anybody watching online, but that's okay. If you guys get a chance, share this, because this is a message that people need to hear. Amen? Amen. But if there were people, if there are people, especially people that don't, that are far off from God, they may sit in a service like this, and I'm sure they ask that very point right there. There's probably many people all over the U.S. right now that are sitting in a service like this and asking that same question. What's the point? Right? Would you guys agree with that? Oh, yeah. What's the point? What's the point of this sermon? What's the point of this series? What's the point of this place where you sit? What's the point of these praises that we sing? What's the point of the power that we speak of? What is the point of all of this? And if that's you asking that, or if you know somebody that has asked that, Guess what? I'm glad. I'm glad you asked, or I'm glad they asked. Okay? Here's the point of it. Here's, the, here's what Peter is getting to. The point of this. The point of the series. The point of all of this. Okay? The point of the power. The point of the Spirit. The point of the Spirit's power is to point to the source of power. Amen. That's the whole point. Yeah. The whole point of everything. The whole point of why we, just like Mark said, the whole point of why we gather here. It's not so you can become a better person. It's not so your kids can have better morals. Because guess what? Morals won't save anybody. Right. It's so that we together and we individually can point to the one who gives the point of even being here. That's the whole point of it all. Right? Mm -hmm. The point is to point to Jesus. Amen? Amen? That's the point. Not to a program. Not to a production, not to a professional, and not to personal preference. We'll never be a church that doesn't preach, proclaim, promote, and point to the singular subject of Jesus. Amen. 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 And I hope you can say that for you. Yeah. Because if you're a child of God, if you've been bought by the blood... Guess what? That's your main point now, is to point to the singular subject of Jesus. That's right. In your work life, in your friend life, in your daily life, in your personal life, in your quiet time, all of it. Your singular purpose is to point to the one, point to the singular subject. Amen? Amen? That's right. <laughs> you know why? I, I, when he laid this sentence on my heart. I was just like, wow, God, <laughs> Woo, you're stepping on my toes now. Without the singular subject of Jesus, guess what? This goes, it's no longer a church of Christ without singular subject of Jesus. You know what it becomes? It becomes a cult of, oh, yeah, I saw it up there. <laughs> yeah, without the singular subject of Jesus, this is no longer a church of Christ. It becomes a cult of the culture. When prosperity is, is preached, when uh, your better life is preached, when all of this stuff is preached, that becomes a cult of culture. That's not what the church of Christ is about. The church of Christ is to point to the Christ. Point to the Messiah. Point to Jesus. Amen? Amen. The point is that we must have a radical emphasis on Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's, right. That's what the emphasis of the empowerment is. It's good to be want to be empowered from on high, right? Sure. But if the emphasis is wrong, then the want for empowerment is wrong. Mm. If you're not emphasizing Jesus, there's no point in you being empowered. Mm. <sighs> yeah. Amen? Right. It's a hard one to swallow, isn't it? But it's true. To be radically effective. You guys want to be radically effective, right? Yeah. Amen. Raise your hand if you want to be radically effective. And I'm going to quit asking, do you want to be radically effective as a church? Because I think it's obvious you guys all say we want to be radically effective as a church, right? right. I want to make this personal. All right. 
Do you want to be radically effective as a Christian? Amen. Do you want to be radically effective as a person? Yeah. Do you? Absolutely. Okay. Then you got to have this radical empowerment and you got to have a radical emphasis. Mm. And that's what Peter's getting to here. You got to have a radical empowerment and you got to have a radical emphasis. And that radical emphasis, guess what it only comes from? It only comes from the radical empowerment, which should lead to what we talked about last week, the radical evidence. Right. Then you have a radical emphasis. See how this is all working now? Yep. So being radically empowered, it should give you a radical emphasis. Amen? Yep. It should, we should, that's what Peter, and I want you to, I want you to show, show you guys something. If you look at verses 22 through 25. Count how many times, I want you to go back and I want you to count how many times Peter says he refers to God and he refers to Jesus. I already did the counting for you, so you don't have to count, but I, I can tell you. So he, and I'm talking about when he says him or he or something like that. He's, he mentions God five times and he mentions Jesus four times. He refers to them five and four times in those three verses, four verses, however many verses it is, right? Do you think Peter was making a radical emphasis on Jesus? Amen. So for us to be, for us to get to what's the point, for us to show people what's the point, right? Because that's really what it is. That's really what we do this for is to show people what's the point and to point to the point. Amen. Mm -hmm. We must have a, this is the first point. I'm going to say point a lot. Just so you guys know. First point is we must have a radical emphasis on a singular subject. And who is that singular subject you guys saw? Say it together. Jesus. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. What's the singular subject? You guys all say it together. Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Peter's point in this sermon is that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit here in Acts has to do with Jesus of Nazareth. That's the first thing he says. If you look at verse 22, it says, fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth, this guy, this Jesus that you crucified, that's the whole point of his sermon. That's the whole point of it. Jesus himself, Jesus himself promised to send the Holy Spirit, did he not? Right. And that was the whole role of the Holy Spirit was to witness and to glorify him. In John chapter 15, 26 through 27, it says, but I will send you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, kind of his last instructions, his last talk with them, his last rally in the troops, right? His last team huddle, right? For those of you that, are work, that work, you guys may have team huddles. I mean, I work too. I had a, <laughs> I had a, I had a phone call with, my, with a family member um, trying, asking me to, the, the point of it was to ask me to watch my niece for the summer. And when I was like, dude, I, I work all day, he's like, you work? What do you do? No. <laughs> yeah, it was not, not cool. But anyway, this is the last team huddle, okay? John chapter 15, 26 through 27 says, But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify. Say, you, you. must also testify about me. Because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. So, what's the point? The point of the Spirit, where, that's who he was just talking about, right? Mm -hmm. The Spirit of truth. The point of the Spirit is to point to the Savior. Right. Yes. The point of the Spirit is to point people to the Savior. Right? right? Point people to the Savior. The power of the Holy Spirit has the sole point of a singular subject. What is that singular subject? Jesus. Just Jesus. Period. Right? Just Jesus. That's the whole point of the Holy Spirit. It's not so you can live a better life. It's not so you can have more stuff. It's not so you can have power to do certain things and power to do certain miracles and power to do... No. The whole point of the Spirit is to point to the singular subject. Just Jesus. If you're, will, if you're unwilling to bear witness to Jesus, you guys listen to me, okay? Everybody, do I have everybody's attention? Because yep. mm -hmm. this one, talk about 
teal stoves beaten crunched. If you're unwilling to bear witness to Jesus, you can forget about experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Let me say that again for the people in the back. Jamie, that's you, I guess. <laughs> She's like, I'm listening. If you're unwilling to bear witness about Jesus, you can forget about the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I said it. Because that's the whole point of the Spirit, isn't it? Yep. It's to bear witness to Jesus. And so if you don't want to have anything to do with bearing witness to Jesus, you can forget about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in your life and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life. But I don't want you guys to do that. Because we want to be radically effective, right? Yes. Which means you want to be radically empowered, right? right? Which means you need a radical emphasis on Jesus. Amen? Amen. The Spirit's task on this earth is to make much of Jesus. This makes the empowered church's mission to do what? To make much of the Messiah. It's the whole point. So what's the point? Make much of the Messiah. So what does this mean? I'm going to ask the same question that they asked to begin Peter's sermon. What, what in the world does this mean? What's the point? What's the point to us, right? Because that's what we come for sermons, is to see what the point for us is, how we can apply this to our lives, right? The point is, we must point out the person of Jesus to the people. Yeah. That's the point. That's the point. That's the point of the empowerment. That's the point of you coming in here right now. That's the point of being radically effective, is to point out the person of Jesus to people. Amen? You guys agree with that? Absolutely. We're, look at verse 36. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take verse 36 and then verse 37 and 38. Those are going to be the three main verses that we're going to be uh, emphasizing, if I should, if I should say. If we're going to emphasize something. Um, and the, the points are going to be drawn out of here, okay? So verse 36 says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Amen? Amen. The whole point of, G of Peter's sermon was pointing out the person of Jesus to these people that needed to know the person of Jesus. Right. And there are people in here, you can come to church and still not know the person of Jesus. Right. <laughs> Do you guys know that? Yep, yep. You can come to church and still not know the person of Jesus. And I want to point you to the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because the person of Jesus is the point of everything. And he's the only one that can change lives. He's the only one that can save souls. Right. Amen. He's the only one that can make a radical difference in your life. Right. And so the point that I want to point to is, number one, he pointed to the plan he perfected. That's what Peter did here. He said there, God has made this Jesus. This Jesus. Peter told them plainly who Jesus was. He told them plainly. He said, this Jesus, the guy that you just saw few days ago, a few weeks ago, that Jesus, that Jesus is who I'm talking about. That Jesus was sent from God. That Jesus was the plan of God from the very beginning. Amen. He is, was, and always will be the promised Messiah. That's what Peter is saying. Right. He was God's plan A from the very beginning. Amen. 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 We don't need a plan B because we already got plan A provided for us. That's right? right? Mm -hmm. The prophets preached to him. <laughs> preach of him that's what peter does a good job of giving some prophecy some old testament prophecy to these devout jews who know new old testament prophecy the prophets preached him david declared him like i said they kind of worshiped david a little bit so he brought in david and said david is the one that was declaring him as well but israel the people he's talking to crucified and killed him that's plan a from the very beginning right they knew who he was, they witnessed all the signs and wonders, and yet willfully and wrongfully sent him to die. That's what Peter's saying. Yet, Peter says that this was divinely designed by God. Look at verse 23. If you guys look back to verse 23, what does he say there? It says, though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge. You used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. Peter's saying that 
It was God's divine design from the very beginning. Right? right? Mm -hmm. You killed him and you crucified him, but God already had it planned out from the beginning. That was plan A, right? Yep. God knew we needed a plan A, and guess what? He still knows we need a plan A today. Right. Sure enough. He did. He knew from the very beginning when he created. Is he not omniscient? Right. Which is all knowing. Right. Then did he not know when he created Adam and Eve? Did he not know when he cast Lucifer out of heaven and he came down to earth as Satan? Did he not know that we would need a plan A from the very beginning? Right. He did know that we had a. And he still knows that you need a plan A in your life today. Right. Amen. Amen. Everything in this world we try on our own. And our own, our own, on our own will and our own working, guess what's going to happen to that? It's going to fail. Because that's plan B, C, D, E, F, all the way through whatever letter you want to assign it. But God knew we needed a plan A, and he still knows we need a plan A today. Still applies. Still applies. It's only when you come to the end of your plans that you can see Jesus plainly. Amen. It's only when you come to the end of your purposes the end of your preferences, that you can see Jesus clearly, yeah. plainly. That's the only way. And that's where these people, that's where Peter is trying to get these people to. Yeah. And guess what? Every time I preach, that's what I'm trying to get people to. Mm -hmm. Every time I go anywhere, that's what I'm trying to get people to, is to see that you've got to come to the end of your own plans to be able to see Jesus plainly. It's only when you come to the end of your own power that you can see Jesus is the point of everything. Amen? Right. Jesus is the perfection of God's plan. Yes. That's bottom line. Point blank period. Jesus is the perfection of God's plan. And that's what Peter's trying to get these people to say, see. And guess what? That's what we should be getting, trying to get people to see. Right. Is that your plans and your purposes and your, all of that stuff it doesn't matter a hill of beans to God's perfect plan. Right. Yeah, I said hill of beans. That's, I went country there. It doesn't matter a hill of beans, right? And so in that, he points out the plan that Jesus perfected. And then he points to the price that he paid. He says there, uh, look again in verse 36. It says, um, therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. Whom you crucified. Who crucified Jesus? Let me ask you guys that. I'm asking you a question. Who crucified Jesus? Huh? The people that Peter is talking to right here. Okay? He's talking to, I'm sure, remember, this is Pentecost, so this is a great festival. This is, they're probably, I think I said the very first sermon, or one of the sermons or whatever, that it was about a million to two million people. It's really not. It's really about a hundred to two hundred thousand people. Okay, that are gathered here. And so he's preaching to that large of a crowd. Okay, and I'm sure that all 100 to 200,000 of those people, all these people that are in the sound of Peter's voice right now, I'm sure they're thinking, I didn't crucify Jesus. And I'm sure you're thinking in here right now, I didn't nail those nails into his hands. I didn't put that crown of thorns on his head. Guess what? Your sin did. Your sin did. Peter made it personal who crucified Jesus. He's preaching to Jews, his own people, God's own people, right? Yep. And Gentiles. Mm -hmm. There's Gentiles there at the time too. Yep. And guess who the Gentiles are? Yes. Our own people. Mm -hmm. A.K.A. you and I. Yeah. And so when it says that you crucified Jesus, you can insert your name right there. Mm -hmm. Chris crucified Jesus. Robin crucified Jesus. Steve crucified Jesus. Right. The reality is that it wasn't just the Romans who crucified him. Right. It wasn't just the Jews who crucified him. It was sin that sent him to the cross. Yeah. It was the sin of the world that sent him to the cross. But you know what? The good news is. Sin may have sent him to the cross. But love left him there. Right. <laughs> Jesus had the power to call down a legion of angels at any time he wanted to, to take him off of that cross. If the pain became too much, if it became too much to be away from God, to separate from God, 
But because of love, he left himself there. Sin sent him to the cross, but love left him there. John 3, 16 through 17. We all know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Amen. So you and I, we send Jesus to the cross. People you come into contact with, they're the reason that he paid the price. Your family that doesn't know him, your family that does know him, they're the reason that paid, he paid the price. And more importantly than the price that he paid, because the price is pretty important, right? Aren't you glad you don't have to pay the price for your sin? Amen? Because what is, I'm going to quote this scripture a little bit later, but what is the wages of sin? Yeah. Death, right? What's the penalty of sin? Death, yeah. right? So aren't you glad you don't have to pay the price for it? But you know what? You kind of do because you got to die to yourself. <laughs> but you don't have to physically die because of it, right? You don't have to spiritually die and spend eternity in hell because of it because Jesus already paid that price, right? But now you can point to the place that he possesses too. That's what Peter does here. Look at it again in verse 36. It says, uh, whom you crucified, that no... Know for sure, certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Amen? Amen. Nevertheless, so Peter's point, preaching this message, and he's pointing to Jesus, and he's saying, you killed him, you crucified him, you're the, one that, you're the reason that he paid the price. And more, important, more, more effectively to the, to the people he's preaching to, I mean, they're literally saying, crap. We missed the Messiah, and we actually had him killed. So can you imagine the, 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 how their hearts are affected right now? Right. I mean, he goes on to tell how their hearts are affected just in a minute. But um, nevertheless, Peter says, God raised him up from the dead. Amen? Amen? Death could not keep him in the grave. Death could not keep him, and the grave could not hold him. Right. Amen? amen? Can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. Because it's because of that that we have life eternal and life everlasting. You can walk in the Spirit. Right? Amen? Peter puts into perspective that Jesus is in his rightful place. And that is not in the grave. Amen? Amen? Right. Unlike their King David, he is not still dead. Amen? <laughs> God is not still dead. Jesus is not still dead. Amen? Right. I said this a, like a few weeks ago, I think for Easter, that you can go to the grave, the tomb, whatever you want to go to, of any other God... Buddha, Muhammad, whoever else, you know, all these great people, all these great men, right? You can go to their grave in the tomb, and there's bones still there. But you can go to the tomb of Jesus, and there ain't no bones there, That's right. right? There ain't no flesh there. there. Because you know why? Because he literally rose from the dead, yeah. amen? amen? And he's not there where David is. Still to this day, David is still there. God raised this Jesus, who we are all witnesses. He says that in verse 32. We're all witnesses of it. And exalted him to the right hand of God, a place of ultimate power and authority. The right hand of God, that's what that means. Place of ultimate authority and power, where he is both Lord and Messiah. Amen. Amen. I should have gotten some claps for that, because he is Lord, he's still Lord and Messiah today. Amen. 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 Now I'm going to make a controversial comment. You know, last week we addressed some, and I love this, I've heard some other people comment about it. We addressed some Baptist elephants in the room last week. You guys remember that? Yeah. Today, I'm going to burst some Baptist bubbles. <laughs> you guys ready to have your Baptist bubble bursted? Yes, I'm on. Controversial comment. There is no need for you to make him Lord and Messiah. I see some looks. You know, he already is Lord and Messiah, right? See, when we think we get to make him Messiah, guess what that gives us the power to do? To turn around and make him not Messiah. And guess what? You don't have the power to make him not Messiah. He already is Lord and Messiah. So who are you to make him Messiah? Who are you to make him Lord? 
Peter says he already is, right? <clears throat> Jesus already is exalted and elevated to his rightful place. That's right. He already is. He is already seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is already at the place of power. He is already making intercession. He is already there. He is already ruler over all. That's right. He already is. The question is, have you given him rightful place in your life? Have you put him in his rightful position in your life? Yes. Mm. Have you exalted and elevated him to his rightful position in your life? He's already there. You just got to make it personal to you. He already has the throne of heaven, but he wants the throne of your heart. That's right. He already has the throne of heaven. He just wants you to give him the throne of your heart. And so there's no need for us to make him Messiah and Lord. Guess why? He already is. If Look at Romans 10, 9 through 10, 9 through 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. See that? He already is Lord, mm -hmm. right? Yep. You just got to confess it with your mouth and believe it with your heart. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. That's right. I think I missed a whole... Yeah, I missed a whole section of my notes. That's okay, though. The... There's, there was an important point of a Greek word that I wanted to point out there. So it says there that, uh, that Peter uses, the Holy Spirit uses the phrase that God has made... See that in verse 36? God has made this Jesus, whom you both whom you crucified, both Lord and Savior, or both Lord and Messiah. That word there is the aorist form of a Greek verb. You know what that means? I know you guys probably could care less about Greek. But that word, what he used, the word that he uses right there, that has made, that basically means that it's a verb that happened in the past that has continuing effects today. Ah. And so when I say that you don't have to make him Messiah. That's why I say that, because he already has been made Messiah for all time. Yes. Mm -hmm. You just got to make him that of your own life. <clears throat> while, we're on the, <laughs> while we're on the subject of controversial comments, and while I'm bursting Baptist balloons, can I go ahead and... Wow, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that took me off guard. Can I go ahead and burst another Baptist balloon? <clears throat> What I'm, what I'm bursting here is the things that we say, mm -hmm. that we really don't know why we say them the way we say them, and they really aren't biblical, okay? Here's another one. There's also no need to accept Jesus. And a hush falls over the crowd because people are like, whoa, I've been told my whole life I need to accept Jesus. <laughs> Jesus didn't come for and doesn't want your acceptance. He doesn't. He wants your repentance and your reliance and he wants your relationship. But he didn't come to be accepted. He didn't come to be liked. He didn't come. He wants your heart. He wants your life. He wants to be Lord. Right. He doesn't want to be accepted like a friend request. He didn't send he didn't send you a Facebook friend request for you to accept. Right? Yeah. Now, I see a lot of... <laughs> whew, I'm, I'm treading on some water here. Now, it does require you to receive him. But he didn't come for you to accept him. He didn't come for you to like him. He didn't come to be liked. He came to be Lord. Right. He didn't come... Mm. Now, it says there that... He is a friend of sinners, right? Yes. It says in the Bible that. And it says that God is a friend, right? Closer than a brother, Closer than a brother right? right? So he does want to be all that. But that's not the reason he came. Right. He didn't come to be a buddy that, you, that could walk beside you. And then when you went somewhere that you didn't want that buddy to go, you could point, put him away and be like, uh, you just stay back there. No. He came to be Lord. Right? He's in his rightful place already. 
He just want his, he wants his rightful place in your life. So what's the point? What's the point of all this? What's the point of me preaching so controversially? <laughs> the point is that we must radically emphasize The point is, the point, say this, but the point we must radically emphasize is this singular subject. Jesus leads to save souls. That's right. Amen? Yeah. Amen? That's what we must radically emphasize. Is that when you profess him as Lord and Savior, and you say, God, I already know you're Lord and Messiah, and now... I exalt you to Lord and Messiah of my life, that leads to save souls. Amen? Amen. Man, it got quiet in here when I started getting controversial. Point number two, we must radically emphasize a saving of souls. Amen. And that's what Peter goes on to radically emphasize. First, he radically emphasizes who Jesus is, right? Mm -hmm. He points people to the person of Jesus. Yes. He says, this Jesus this Jesus, you crucified him. He did all these miracles and wonders. You crucified him. He came. He died for you. But God knew that already from the beginning and exalted him to the place where he rightfully is right now. Amen? Amen. And now he switches it. The point switches. Still the same point. Still the singular subject to Jesus, right? But it switches to the saving of souls. Yep. And so number two, we must radically emphasize the saving of souls. The Holy Spirit took Peter's message, made much of the Messiah, and used it to hit the hearts of the people. Mm. Eyes were opened to see the work of the truth. Ears were opened to hear the word of the truth. And now hearts were opened to receive the witness of the truth. Amen. Right? In John 16, 13 through 14, Jesus, he foretold this coming already. He said in John 16, 13 through 14, still talking to the same, still the same last huddle, right? Final huddle with his disciples. When the spirit of truth comes, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. So what's the point? What's the point? The point of the Spirit is to point people to salvation. It's the point of the Spirit. The point of the Spirit is to point people to the Savior. And then when, they point him, when he points them to the Savior, he uses you to point people to the Savior. Then the point of the Spirit is to point people to salvation. That is the whole point. That is the whole... So you're asking, what's the point? Right? Anybody still asking, what's the point? Or do you got the point? Okay. If you're unwilling to speak salvation, just like if you're unwilling to speak about the Savior, if you're unwilling to speak salvation into people's lives, if you're unwilling to speak salvation, you can forget about experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You know why? Because that's the whole point of the Spirit. That's, right. that's the whole point. It's to speak salvation. Amen? Amen. The empowering of the Spirit still has the sole purpose of the saving of souls. Now, He does a work in you once you have Him in you. Like, we covered that last week, remember? The, the evidence, the internal evidence, how He comforts, how He guides you into all truth, how He uh, convicts you of your sin, how He does all of this stuff. He still does a work in you. But the whole point of this right here, the whole point of the pouring out of the Spirit, and the whole reason why we have the Spirit inside of us is to point people to salvation. So what do we do? Just like the people asked Peter and the boys, what do we do? Brothers, we're pierced to the heart. What do we do? What's the point? We must point people to the person of Jesus. We, we got to point out the person of Jesus to people. And then when they get who Jesus is, then it's time for us to point them to the person of Jesus, right? Yeah. And 
The, the fact that he is the only one that can take them out of the life that they're living. They can, he's the only one that can fix financial problems. He's the only one. Dave Ramsey thinks he can, <laughs> right? But really, who does Dave Ramsey claim? Jesus as Lord and Savior, right? Mm -hmm. So who is really using that? Who is really the one that's called curing financial problems? It's Jesus, yeah. right? He's the only one that can, can, that can cure family problems. He, he's the only one that can cure relational problems. He's the only one that can cure addiction problems. He is the only one that can cure anything. That's why we speak the name of Jesus, just like that song, right? Mm -hmm. So what should we do? We should point people to the person of Jesus. Verses 37 and 38, look at it again with me, those two verses, because we're going to hit those pretty hard right now. It says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Peter and the boys, brothers, what should we do? Our hearts are broken. Our, like, we don't know what else to do right now. What should we do? Peter replied, repent, be baptized each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter, and really the Holy Spirit power working through Peter, now points to the power to pierce hearts. Right? They were pierced to the heart. That's what it says there. Peter's words probed and penetrated the hearts of the people. I got to tell them myself. <laughs> I gave Robin, because she was looking at me, so I got to tell them myself. You know, I got to be real authentic and different up here. Um, I was... I was like finalizing this part of the sermon yesterday, and I, so I gave Robin four words, and I was like, okay, which one of these four words is the most intense out of all of them? And I'll, I'll, show, I'll tell you the other two words right here. So <laughs> Peter's words, they probed and penetrated the hearts of people, right? But it's really the Spirit's work that pricked and pierced the hearts of the people. So I asked her what those, out of those four words, which one was the most intense? And she was like, I think pierced, Right? Which is funny because that's the one the Bible uses, amen? amen. But really, that's what, it, that's what it comes down to. Peter's words, they're the, it's, it started to probe into the ears and penetrate the ears and penetrate the hearts of people, right? But it was really the Spirit's power that did the pricking and the piercing of the hearts. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. See, our words can only do so much. They say sticks and stones break bones. But words don't hurt, right? Isn't that what they say? I think Garrett preached, his first sermon was on, on the power of the tongue, wasn't it? And he's, he was like, bite that thing. You guys remember that sermon? Anybody here for that sermon? Which, he's preaching again next week. As of right now, just so you guys know. So if you want to hear another one of those kind of sermons, come back. Garrett's like, thanks for building me up. <laughs> hey, you got it now, dude. <laughs> but our words, they do say sticks and stones can break bones, but words don't hurt, right? I call BS on that. I do, because words do have power, right. right? They do have power to hurt. They do have power to build somebody up. That's why words are mentioned. That's why Ephesians 4.29, we hit that hard this past week with our kids. Ephesians 4.29 says, speak words that build up and encourage people, right? Not people that, not words that tear people down. But, but our words only have limited power without the Spirit's work. Oh, that's right. Our, our words do have power, but they only have limited power without the Spirit's work. The power of the Spirit is the only one that can point to the piercer of souls. Mm. Our words can point somebody to Him, but it's really the Spirit's work. It's really the power of the Spirit that is the one that points people and gets souls pierced because of that. Jesus is that one. Jesus is that person. He is the piercer of souls. Amen? Amen. When was the last time your words pierced hearts? When was the last time your words pierced the heart of somebody? Not because of your words, but because of the Spirit's work using those words. And I'm not talking about piercing to hurt. Because we're all good at using words to pierce to hurt people, right? We all have tongues like fire and tongues like sharp double-edged swords, right? Right? But when was the last time your words pierced somebody to heal them? Pierced somebody to build them up? 
Here's somebody to encourage them in Jesus. When's the last time your words, when's the last time your heart was pierced by this word and by the work of Jesus? Right. See, a lot of us come in here, and I'm guilty of this. I was guilty of this for years, coming into this church building, coming into this church service, coming under preaching, and sitting there with a heart of stone, Saying, this doesn't apply to me. I wish somebody else would be here to hear this. I wish somebody else, man, they could really get something out of this message. But when's the last time you sat here in this service with your heart pierced by the word and the work of Jesus? When's the last time at home you were worshiping and your heart was pierced by the word and the work of Jesus? The spirit won't have his work in you until you let your heart be pierced. By the spirit that can, is the only one that can pierce the souls. That's right. I felt the spirit all over that one. Mm -hmm. The piercing work of the spirit always begins with the realization of your need for pardoning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it always begins with your, the realization of your need for pardoning. If you're sitting there saying, I don't need this. I don't, what, what's the point of him saying all that controversial stuff and the balloons popping and the, all of the things, the, the slides up on the screen and the, the music that we sing. If you're sitting there like thinking that in your heart, then you're not recognizing the pardoning that you need so that your heart can be pierced. Right. You need forgiveness. I need forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. And when you realize that, like these people realize it, that's when the piercing work can happen. And so Peter, he points to Jesus as the only power to pardon sin. And when they ask him, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Peter's answer to that question, what must we do, was a straightforward answer. Was it not? Yeah. Peter was a straightforward dude. Like he's one of those that you... You, you, could, you didn't know, or you always knew where he stood, right? right? Sometimes I took him a little too far. Sometimes he put his foot in his mouth, right? Sometimes he cut people's ears instead of cutting people's hearts, yeah, okay. right? And I think sometimes we, we cut people's ears and don't let the Spirit cut people's hearts. But Peter's answer, it was straightforward. He didn't sugarcoat anything with them. He didn't. He didn't say, well, you know, you're living an alternate lifestyle right now. And, you know, God loves you just the way you are. And, you know, the life that you want is just on the other side of this. No. Did he preach like that? No. He preached straightforward. He didn't sugarcoat anything. They had sinned. They crucified their Christ. And they needed more than just a change of conduct. Amen? Amen? They needed a complete change of heart. And the same goes with us. A person will never get saved until they know they're lost. That's right. Amen. That's true. A person will never get saved. You can sit here in a church pew, on a church seat, attend a service. You can, you can even act like you're praising and worshiping. But until you realize that you're lost, you'll never realize you need a Savior. I love this quote from, from Charles Spurgeon. I love Charles Spurgeon. Any other Charles Spurgeon fans out there? Amen. I had to put this up there. He says, It is idle to attempt to heal those who are not wounded, to attempt to clothe those who have never been stripped, and to make those rich who have never realized their poverty. And is that not so true? Mm -hmm. And it goes right along with what I'm, just, what I'm saying and the way Peter preached. People will never be saved Unless they know they need to be saved. They'll never realize the extent to which they can be forgiven. Until they realize the extent of which they need to be forgiven. The spirit can only point to the savior. When we're done sugarcoating the state of our sin. The spirit will only point to the savior. When we're done sugarcoating the state of our sin. I'm done sugarcoating the state of sin. Right. I'm done sugarcoating the state of my sin. I'm done sugarcoating the state of 
sin period in general, right? Because if there's a if if, if there's an epidemic in the in U.S. American Christianity today, it's that we sugarcoat the state of sin, right? I'm done doing it. I'm done doing it. I suck without my Savior. You suck without your Savior. We all suck without our Savior. Right? I'm going to make a shirt that says, I suck without my Savior. I really am. I promise you I am. And I'll wear it up here preaching from it. Because you know why? It's true. It's true. And it's time that we get to, we're, it's time we're done sugarcoating it. Now, does that mean I want you to walk up to somebody, just any random person on the street and say, you suck without a Savior? <laughs> no. No, but there's a way to do it that won't push people away. That's kind of what Peter did right here, though, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, this Jesus who you crucified, you suck. I don't suck anymore because I have a Savior. Actually, Peter does still suck, and I still suck. But I, I suck even worse without my Savior. Amen? Go. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all suck without our Savior. I love it. I love saying suck from the stage. <laughs> how, many, how many more times can I say it? But it's so true. Does that not get your attention? Okay. Is that not the Spirit's work? Is to get people's attention? To point them to Jesus? Thankfully, here's the good news. You guys ready for some good news? Yes. Thankfully, we don't have to stay stuck and sucking in our sin. <laughs> we don't. Amen? That's what Peter says there. He gives them the point blank period way to get out of their sin. We have a solution. And Peter gives the solution straightforward. He says, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus, receive forgiveness. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus, receive forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is that not a good news verse right there? Amen. Because that shows you that we don't have to stay stuck and sucking in our sin. I know, I'm just trying to get the word suck as many times as I can from stage. <laughs> but Peter gives them the solution. It's the same solution that we have. It's the same solution that the Spirit can empower you to give somebody else. He says that repent, which means turn away from. Complete 180. That means you're walking this way. And when you repent, do a 180. You walk away from your sin and walk to Jesus as Savior. Because you know the sin and the Savior are on opposite ends of the spectrum. That's what repent means. It means a complete 180 from your old ways. A complete change of heart. First, which will then lead to a change of conduct. It doesn't mean change, try to change your conduct first. Because you know why? A change of conduct will never save anybody. You gotta, the change of conduct comes from a change of heart. That's what repent means. Okay, controversial comment time again. <laughs> Gonna burst another Baptist balloon. Burst, burst, another, burst another Baptist balloon. He did it, you missed it. Do it again. Do it again. Whoa! <laughs> and we just bursted a speaker too. Here's a controversial comment. Can we all just stop saying, you guys listening? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we all just stop saying, I'm just a sinner saved by grace? I see, I see looks. I see looks. Why? Why? Why am I saying that? Why do I ask that? Yes, please. Yes, I am a sinner saved by grace, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is when we say it, we always say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You're not just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. You know why? Because I am also set apart for holiness. I'm much more than a sinner saved, just a sinner saved by grace. I'm set apart for holiness. See, when you say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, that means you can say, you're giving a little out there that you can say, I'm just going to stay stuck in my sin, but I'm still saved by grace, right? 
So yes, we are a sinner saved by grace, but you're not just a sinner saved by grace. You're so much more than that. You're so much more than that. I'm also set apart unto holiness. I'm also sanctified and set free from that sin. I'm also striving and seeking daily to be more like my Savior. That's what I'm just. Yes, I am a sinner saved by grace, but I'm all of that stuff too. Right? right? And if it wasn't for my Savior, I would still just be a sinner. Not necessarily saved by grace. And if it wasn't for striving to be like my Savior, then yeah, I would just be a sinner. Just a sinner saved by grace. But I'm so much more than that. Yeah, I do still sin. Yeah, I do. But daily, I'm still striving to be set apart unto His holiness. And striving and seeking to be more like my Savior. Right? Then Peter says the second thing. He says, repent, turn away from that stuff. That's why he says repent. That's why we have to repent. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't receive forgiveness without repentance. Wow. See, some people don't realize that. Nope. When you just say, God, forgive me. I know I'm going to be doing this the next day. I know I'm going to be doing this the next weekend. Do you think he really forgives you? It says there that you've got to repent, right? Mm -hmm. And then he says, be baptized. Now this, I could get into a whole lot of controversy about this, but I'm not going to. I just want you to know, what did we talk about being baptized last week meaning? Baptized the Holy Spirit. Baptized the Holy Spirit. But what does it mean? What does the word baptizo mean? It means to be immersed, immersed with, and identified with, right? And so that's what Peter's saying here. So he's saying, repent, turn away from your old ways, be baptized, which means be immersed with and identify with Jesus as Lord and Messiah because he's already there anyway. Now you just need to be immersed with him and identify with him and publicly profess your new identity. Is that not the power of the Spirit? To publicly profess our new identity in Christ? And then he says, be forgiven. Have your debt wiped clean. That's the power of pardon right there. Amen. That means you have a debt that you owe, and Jesus took that place, and he took that debt upon himself, and he canceled that debt. But it takes repenting and identifying with Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. People need to be pointed to Jesus for the piercing and pardon that is only found in him. And I feel like there's people... Today, there may be people in here that need to be pointed to Jesus for the piercing and the pardoning of their sin. I feel it. And I'm not going to start preaching Jesus until they realize that he's the point. I'm not going to stop preaching Jesus until they realize their need to be pointed to him. I'm not going to stop preaching Jesus until that happens. I'm not going to stop pointing people to Jesus. I'm not going to stop pointing to Jesus as the power. I'm not going to stop. Can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> And I'm not going to be, I'm done sugarcoating things. I don't know if you guys can tell that. <laughs> I'm done sugarcoating things. I'm done playing church. Because that's what sugarcoating things is. It's playing church. It's allowing people to come in here and hear the preaching of the word and see the power of the spirit and see the work of the spirit and just go on living their life like they just want to live their life. Because we're sugarcoating the, the state that they're in, the sin that they're in. Telling you. Until it's all about the Savior, you're still sucking sin. And you're still sucking in that sin. People need to be pointed to Jesus for the piercing and the pardon that's only found in him. Only then can they receive the promise. And that's what Peter points to next. He points to the power of the promise. It says, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter ties this whole sermon, his whole sermon. He tells them plainly who Jesus is. He tells them plainly that they need Jesus. 
tells them plainly how to get Jesus. And he ties it all together and says, this is what happens when you do all of this. He ties it, he brings it all back to the power that began the whole ser sermon to begin with. You can't, you're going to like how he does that? The promise of the very gift of the very power that he was preaching under. And guess what? That power is promised to you. If you do all of those things, that same power is promised to you. And it also there, he doesn't stop with just you. What does he say? He says in verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. That means there's people that you'll come into contact with, your family, your friends, your coworkers, that that promise is for. It just takes us working under the power, pointing to the point with the right emphasis, a radical emphasis, I would say, on who the point is all about. Notice how personal every aspect has been. Did you guys notice that? The piercing. Was it not personal to each person that heard this? Mm -hmm. It was personal. They were all pierced to their hearts. The pardoning. Was that not personal? He says there. It says, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus. The pardoning is personal. And guess what? The power is personal too. And guess what? The point is personal too. The whole point is personal. So what is the point? What's the point? What's the point of all of this? The point is that people personally need Jesus pointed out to them. And people personally need to be pointed to Jesus' piercing, pardon, and promise. Tradition won't save you. Family heritage won't save you. Your grandmama's salvation won't save you. Your daddy's salvation won't save you. The fact that your family has always been in church for all generations, it won't save you. Personal preference won't save you. Political agendas won't save you. Changing your conduct won't save you. The only thing that will save you is the point of it all. Programs, productions, and personal preferences won't save people. Now we do programs and we do productions and we do stuff like that to point to the people to point people to the one who will. There you go. Right? But the whole point is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pointing to Jesus is the only thing. It's all that will save people. Programs, productions, and personal purposes won't save people. Pointing to Jesus, all that will save people. Right. It's time that we be a radically empowered church with a radical emphasis on Jesus. Right. A, radical, a radically, in fact, a radically effective church. They will radically emphasize Christ. Amen. And to make it more personal. A radically effective Christian will radically emphasize Christ. Amen. And to make it even more personal, because you may be sitting here not identifying as a Christian. You know, today's generation is all about not identifying as a certain thing, right? You may be sitting here thinking, I still don't get the point of all this. I'm still not identifying with Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He already is Lord and Savior. He already is Lord and Messiah. But you may be sitting here thinking, I'm just not doing it. I'm just not identifying with him as my Lord and Savior. Okay. A radically effective person 
will radically emphasize a point. Think about that. What's the point you're radically emphasizing? If you don't identify with Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to radically emphasize your own points, your own personal preferences, your own agendas, your own stuff. But it's time that we get more people radically emphasizing the point. A radically effective Christian, they will radically emphasize Christ. We ready to be that today? Amen. Because I hope so. <laughs> I made that decision in my own life that I'm going to be radically empowered. I'm going to show radical evidence. I'm going to have a radical emphasis. And I know without a shadow of doubt because of what he promises that that will be radically effective. Amen. It's time that we all do that. Amen. Lord God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit power, Lord. I, there's no way I would have been able to preach this message without your powering of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I know it was all you that spoke. Lord, I thank you for that. I just pray with all that I am that your Holy Spirit is piercing people's hearts right now. Or whether it's right now in this room, whether it's right now online, or whether it's online at a different time, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit, with all that I am, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take everything, every point that I emphasize about Jesus, and it will radically pierce hearts. Lord, I believe that we can be a church that can be radically effective, and we can see Maybe not 3,000 people saved, but we can see one saved. And if one is saved, I say that's radically effective. Lord, I pray for that right now. Pray for that one. If they can sit under this and listen to this message and not realize their need for a Savior, I don't have anything for them under my human voice and my human ability. Lord, it's only your Holy Spirit that can do it. And I pray now that that work in a way that has never worked before, Lord. I pray that we allow the person of the Holy Spirit to influence everything that we do, everything that we say, and that lives can be changed in the power of Jesus' name. I love you, Lord, and I ask all this in his name, the name above all names, the name that can do the impossible, the only name that can do the impossible. We ask it in his name right now. All God's people said, 